Welcome, good friends and guests, in the name of the one who is in all and through all, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you this day that we can come together and rest comfortably in your presence, knowing, Lord, that every breath that we take, you are there. Every blink of an eye, you are there. Every wish of our heart, you are there. Rest your spirit upon us, Lord, that we might raise our voices to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. About the service, it's all in your worship folder, so just join along and sing as you feel comfortable. The music is repeated. You'll get the hang of it. And the pew in front of you in the uh, rack is a, a connect card if you are a guest. Uh, or have a prayer concern, please fill that out and drop that in the basket. 
as it comes by. I invite all of you who are able to rise for our opening call to worship. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Let them praise the name of the Lord. The grace of our Lord 
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Creator God, you bring all things into existence, things seen and unseen. Your presence runs through and through. Awaken our hearts and minds, O God, to the light you project from the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 1. I, John, your brother who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash across his chest. His, hair and his, his head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining with full force. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what is and what is to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Here ends the reading.
The Holy Gospel according to Luke. After leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. Then Jesus stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. Demons also came out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Messiah. At daybreak, He departed and went to a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him. And when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea, the gospel of the Lord. Best-selling author but now deceased physicist Stephen Hawking had a goal in life that he put like this. My goal is simple. It is a complete understanding of the universe, why it is and why it exists at all. Today as we wrap up this series of messages, the world of wonder want to talk to you about understanding the universe, why it is and, and why it exists at all. We see that the wise men, after whom this series has taken its cue, they see the star as Stephen Hawking had seen stars and galaxies. They saw the star and, and they followed it to the place of the Christ child where they met, encountered the Divine One, the Holy One of Heaven. And we see that they followed the direction that they got from the night sky. But when they, they got there, they didn't go back the way they came. They didn't follow another star that went in reverse. No, the Bible says this. It says that the wise men were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. Now you know where dreams happen. Dreams happen when you're sleeping during the day or at night and they happen in your mind. We see here that one of the ways that God communicates, connects with us is through our mind, our brain. There's some misunderstanding from some Christian traditions that when you become a Christian, that when you go to church, that you need to check your brain at the doors. That somehow there are questions that you shouldn't be asking. There are certain, uh, certain um, curiosities that you shouldn't entertain. That there are things that you simply should not probe. But we see that in the Bible there's something quite different that God expects, God wants, God connects with us through the use of our mind, through our thoughts. That's why it says in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, He says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. As we apply our minds, our thoughts, and offer them up to God, then God connects, God communicates. And when we do that, our minds are expanded and enlarged. Our hearts are enlarged as well. As we stand before, as the Magi did, the child of heaven, the divine one, the holy one. And there we see the magnitude of what we have been invited to participate in. There's so much throughout the entire Bible that we could go over and dig into that would help us understand this element, this this source of, of, of truth that we don't have time. But we'll focus on just a handful 
And the first one that we, we need to focus on, the first truth, the first insight through Scripture that we need to allow to penetrate our minds is the fact that, that Christ extends beyond the cosmos. You know, Jesus Christ, the Christ child, the one that was the babe of Bethlehem, was eternal and co-eternal with God. And God, through Jesus Christ, created all that exists. And when Jesus was here, He had crucified and raised to, the, to, to new life. He returned to His eternal role and habitation. And we see and we understand and we learn quite clearly that, that Christ, His presence, His being, extends beyond the universe. It says that here in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6, who is able to build God a house since heaven, even the highest heaven, can't contain Him. Another translation, the message puts it like this, the house that I am building has to be the best because our God is the best, far better than any competing gods. But who is capable of building such a structure why the skies, the entire cosmos, can't begin to contain Him. We know from modern science, physics, astrophysics, that our universe is expanding. It is getting larger and larger at a faster and faster pace. But the Bible is quite clear that the entire creation, the universe, no matter how large it gets, no matter how many universes that there might be, can't contain all that is there in the being of God. That's why it says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah says this, who can hide in secret places that I cannot see them, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. There is nowhere in creation, nowhere in the cosmos that, that God's presence isn't there and God's presence doesn't fill. Christ extends beyond, is larger than all that is in existence. A second pearl of wisdom, a second truth that we need to get our minds around or allow to penetrate into our minds is the fact that, that in this grand creation, this cosmos, that Christ is larger than. He is not separate from it, but in fact, He is present in, with, and under the entire creation. That's what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, for in Him, in heaven, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He Himself is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Christ is present in the entire cosmos, in, with, and under. And I use that phrase, in, with, and under, on purpose because that's the phrase that the Lutheran reformers used to describe the reality of what takes place in the Lord's Supper. You may know that Lutherans and, and Catholics differ somewhat in how they understand the meaning of what's taking place in the bread and the wine. For centuries, for millennia, people had taught up to the day of Luther that the bread and the wine uh, become the body and blood of Christ. That in Luther's day, when the priest said the special blessing, the words of con consecration, then in churches today even, a bell rings to tell you that now this is the body and blood. It's gone from bread and wine to the body and blood of Christ. That takes place in the Catholic worldview, both literally, physically, metaphysically, in every single way you can imagine. And that's why in, in Catholic churches, uh, the communion elements, the wine, they don't get poured out into the ground like they do in some Lutheran churches. You know, whatever's left over for our meal, 
will get either reused or it'll get returned to the elements because it is an element. We return it to the ground at times. Or uh, the bread we might feed and give it to a bird. But in the Catholic tradition, uh, that doesn't happen because that's literally, I mean literally, physically, the body and blood. So the priest will finish off the wine, consume it all, and then they'll take the host, the bread, the body of Christ, and not feed it to the birds and not pass it out for people to finish off and polish off, but they'll put it in a special compartment back behind the, the altar, perhaps in the sacristy. It's a place called the, the tabernacle. It's a special little beautiful box, oftentimes gold and nice little lock on it because that's where the host, the body of Christ, and they'll keep that there because you can't use it any other way. It's literally the body of Christ. And so it is actually what it is. But Luther and the Reformers said, you know, we can't quite say that much about the, the body and, and the blood, the bread and the wine, because it doesn't say that in, in the Scriptures. All we can say is that it is the body and, and blood of Christ. We can't say that it, it physically, that it somehow uh, biologically, somehow, somehow um, scientifically becomes that. What we can say, though, is that Christ is present, really present there in the bread and the wine. And this is the phrase from the Lutheran view, in, with, and under. That it is the presence of Christ spatially and really. We can't quite put our finger on exactly scientifically how that might be the case. So we can assert and believe that in this we are participating and sharing in the life of Jesus Christ and the new community and that He has created. What is true of the body and the blood, the bread and the wine, which are elements of the creation, is true of the entire creation. Because the Bible says that Jesus is present throughout, in, and with the entire cosmos. It says that there in Colossians, in Him all things were created. Through Him and for Him all things hold together. Jesus runs through and through the entire creation. There is nowhere in creation that Jesus Christ is not. Even in places where it looks like there's no sign of God or Jesus at all. We know from the world of physics and people like Albert Einstein that, and even back to the days of the Greeks, that, that life, you know, is composed of atoms. And that's kind of one of the basic fundamental building blocks of, of, of matter is these atoms. And one of the things that's fascinating about, about atoms uh, is the smallest, for many people, the smallest point of, of reality is the fact that, that atoms are mostly empty space. I mean, if you take a little acorn and stick it in the middle of Lambeau Field, well, let's forget Lambeau Field. Think about Rand Randall Field, an acorn in the middle of, of Randall uh, Stadium Field, and that would be the, the nucleus of the atom. And then you put around the perimeter the, the big uh, bowl around and put the electrons and protons that sp spin around. That's the rest of that is just space. And, and what is true of the atom is true of our universe, is that you look out there and it looks like there's just a bunch of empty space. But that's not, again, entirely true, because out there in empty space is what they call dark matter and dark energy. There's no empty space out there at all. There's gravitational things happening out there in the place we can't see. And the same is true in that atom that looks like it's mostly space. In fact, it's full of dynamic fields and forces, gravity and the strong and weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, those fields are there making the internal world, the atom, make what it, what it is. And, and what's true of the physical world is also true of the spiritual world and how Christ connects with it is that Jesus Christ is, is through and through everything at all times and there's no, no, no place and, and no time when He is not there. Even right now, you know, while we have the sun, the sun came up this morning and, and, and whether it's morning or noon or night, 
The sun projects energy and light toward our planet throughout the solar system. And, and whether it's morning, noon, or night, then the sun sends out these, these, this light. And some of the light you can see and some you can't see. And one of the forms of light is, are neutrinos. And these little neutrinos are so small that they pass right through solid material. and ma- They pass right through the earth. Even right now there are a hundred trillion, this is what the scientists say, a hundred trillion neutrinos that are being blasted from the sun that are passing right through you and me and through the floor. And just as there was light and energy and power that's flowing through us at all times, the presence of Jesus Christ flows through us at all times. And just as gravity draws everything to a single point in the earth, so the presence of Jesus Christ, invisible at times, is drawing all things to Himself. As we come together and offer up our minds to God. It's simply spectacular, mind-blowing even, that our God, our Savior, the one with whom we have a personal relationship, the one we can call by name, call out Jesus and, and walk with Him, who's larger than the cosmos, who is in, with, and under the entire creation, is among us. And because he is larger and he is in with and under, he is what Stephen Hawking is looking for, that unifying principle, which is what our speaker on Thursday here, Michio Kaku, is all about. Michio Kaku is a, is a colleague and in some ways a, a friend of Stephen Hawking. They both had a similar goal in life, is to boil everything down into a single little phrase. Their goal is to have a single formula that's about an inch long that would fit easily on a single piece of paper that describes all of reality, brings it all together. Stephen Hawking failed at it, Albert Einstein failed at it, and so far Michio Kaku has failed at it. And some theorists and physicists say it's simply not possible. It's just not going to happen. And whether that happens in the world of science and physics or not doesn't really, uh, to me, matter all that much. It'd be exciting. But what matters to me and what is even more significant is that it all comes together in the life of Jesus Christ. That's what it says here in the Bible. In Acts 17, verse 28, Peter is preaching and speaking to the crowds. He says, in Him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your poets have said. And then Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 6, you have one master, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is present in all. Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. And then Paul says in Romans, from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Jesus Christ, the very face, the very being of God, brings it all together. That's what the Gospel of John says in in the first words. Perhaps you have heard In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God and was with God. And and that phrase, in the beginning, of course, throws your mind back, throws my mind back to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, in the beginning of time, in the beginning of space time, in the beginning of creation was the Word. And and, and the Word here in all of our Bibles, no matter what the translation is, is going to have a capital W, capital W-O-R-D. And the Word here for a word doesn't simply mean something that you put together with a few letters or that you put in a sentence or that you use in spoken communication or written communication. Uh, the, the word here for word in the Greek is a special word. It's an important word. It's a powerful word. It's the word logos. And the word logos in 
in the world of the early Christians and in the world of Jesus meant the organizing, creative principle, the reason, the plan, the purpose. All that is wrapped up in that word. In the beginning, the word, reason, logic, purpose, organization, was with God, and that word was Christ. In Jesus Christ, everything comes together and comes to a point. And because everything is in Christ, and because He is in everything, that means that our present situation is a situation of incredible promise and opportunity. Because wherever Christ is, there is the opportunity for new life and for new purpose. And we live in a world that's eager and hungry and desperate for life and purpose and wholeness and healing. And it's right here with us and in us. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for your blessing, for your love. We thank you for your Son who draws all things together. We pray, Lord, that you would capture our minds, shape them, form them, direct them, that we might work hard and apply ourselves to comprehend, to understand your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious God, we thank you that your glory shines throughout the heavens. And we ask, Lord, that you would raise up leaders throughout the world who reflect your glory, that they could lead their people, their nations, toward a world and a life of justice, of equity, and of peace. Lord, in your mercy. God, we thank you for the, the beauty, for the wonder that we experience in this created world, for all the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the critters and the bugs, and Lord, all the plants that bring such meaning and joy. We pray that you would help us to be good stewards of this world, Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for those who are sick, those who are dying, those who are grieving. We pray, Lord, for those who have recently lost loved ones, those who gather here, Lord, with burdens known only to you. Lord, shine your light. Open their hearts, their minds, their eyes to see, to experience in their own darkness your presence, your strength, and your purpose, Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Just take a moment to share Christ's peace with a, a wink, a nod, a handshake, a fist bump, a peace sign, some expression of recognition of those around you. You may be seated. And we do receive an offering, and if you are a guest, we don't expect that you contribute. Uh, you may if you like. It's one of the ways that we share our love for God and become part of God's work in the world. Also, if you're a guest or you have a prayer concern, drop your pew card in the basket. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all the nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son, and in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Everybody in this room is welcome to the Lord's table. Come up the center aisle at the direction of the ushers. Uh, lower your mask, take the wafer in your hand, eat it. Uh, take the cup in your hand, drink it, and put your mask back on, and dispose of your plastic cups at the baskets to the side as you find your way back to your pews. Rise. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you and strengthen you in his peace. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the healing power of this gift of life, your body, your blood, your bread, your wine, your very being uh, placed within us. Breathe upon us, O God, that we might come alive in you and you in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Most all the announcements are in the back of your worship bulletin or the most recent church newsletter, the Bethelite, which is 
out on the wall as you exit the sanctuary, I would uh, make a special point of announcing that today we do have our annual congregational meeting, and it's going to be a Zoom meeting, you know, with the COVID surge and the weather, it makes good sense. And there is in the bulletin here the, uh, the link uh, for the Zoom meeting. So we need to have 100 people there to get a quorum, and I hope that you will all be a part of that. Some good news, some good exciting things to report, uh, fairly standard um, uh, congregational meeting. Also today at, at uh, 4 o'clock we'll have a concert and that's the Seraph Brass and it's a premier all-female brass quintet that um, uh, is something very special to treat. So hopefully you'll be a part of that as well. And if you are a first-time guest we have a gift bag for you. It's got some material and some, some uh, items for, uh, for your a show of appreciation uh, for your coming to Bethel. But uh, before we sing our last hymn, let's have the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Rejoice in Christ our Savior.